User groups with lots to say, interviews and more. No way. Sharing great ideas in the tech community. Fascinating conversations, a plethora of information. Find out for yourself today at Ugtastic.com. Hi, it's Mike with Ugtastic. I'm still here at the Web Visions 2013 for the Gene Cisco Film Center in Chicago. I'm sitting down with Bill Scott. Bill is, the, well, somebody who was recommended to me by more people than anybody else today uh, than somebody I should sit down and talk with. Uh, Bill is a, uh, well, you, you work with PayPal, yep. but can you describe what your title is? Because it was a little bit yeah. more than so, I could. So, <laughs> so I head up uh, what's called, what I call user interface mm -hmm. engineering. Right. And uh, so think of it as the front end development, front end engineering for PayPal. Mm -hmm. uh, all the web technologies, mobile top and desktop, all the things. Um, you know, so, so my background basically is I came from Netflix before I came to PayPal. I was the head of the UI engineering there, closely with the design team uh, for about four years. Right. Built that uh, team up, the engineering team. And then uh, before that I was in Yahoo, and there I did like the Yahoo Design Pattern Library. I was also the Ajax and Agilist at Yahoo. Okay. And, uh, and my, my passion is really around design engineering. So a few small companies. Yeah, a few small companies. And I also have a a book with O'Reilly called Designing Web Interfaces. Okay. It's strictly a design book. Okay. So I'm one of those weird hybrids that uh, that can do JavaScript engineering but also do design. What What is the uh, animal on there? Mine is the most amazing one possible. So the design books have birds, right? Yeah. So mine is the cock of the rock. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the only... Yeah, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't pick it. Yeah, yeah. They picked it, so... Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that's always fun to find out what the animal was. Yeah. Um, I have to get a picture of it. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, the, uh, because the one in my head is not. Yeah, it's TMI. <laughs> uh, so, so okay, so, I mean, obviously you have a, a, a very broad depth of experience. Um, and, but there's one thing that's in particular interesting that's just happened with PayPal here in Chicago. Yeah. Uh, and that is the... Um, Acquisition of Braintree, one of our major yeah. uh, financial um, uh, credit card service companies that are acquired by PayPal. Yeah. Uh, do you have any insight into what happened? Or? Well, I know I know the so the arc that that it ties in really well with the, what I even talked about uh, at the workshop and today at the talk. Uh, we've been on a journey to transform PayPal into an innovative company. Right. Right. Uh, PayPal has been a very good brand and, and very successful. In the, uh, money it's made and those sort of things like that. But when I was leaving Netflix in 2011, it was pretty obvious that, that PayPal wasn't really on my radar as a company to go to, but I knew a few key folks there, including the CTO, that I had a lot of respect for from the previous things they had done. And so they began talking about coming. And we started a journey when David Marcus became president in April of 2012 uh, to transform PayPal to the very lean Netflix like startup. start. Hence the use of Lean UX. So the acquisition of Braintree really is another step in that evolution. It's like here, here's obviously an incredible company that started up as uh, moved at lightning speed, is making a huge impact on the payment solution. Uh, definitely strong in the development community with awesome APIs. Also they have Venmo in New York, you know, which is a great, a great mobile app. So they got mobile talent, API talent. We are already transferring our APIs. This just kind of takes us to the next level, really. And one of the cool things we're going to do, because David is a huge, he's a serial entrepreneur, our president, until uh, PayPal, he only did startups, right? Until uh, he got acquired by PayPal. So he's going through the acquisition so. team. Now he's... Right, now he's acquired. So it's very, very important that we let Braintree continue to be the innovator it is, have, you know, still be called Braintree, be, you know, be able to... Uh, to, to not really change anything, other than give it a great broader breadth and uh, much more you know, financial support in the larger eBay family. And it fits really well with the whole eBay family. So we're, we're, we're really excited. In fact, I met Michael Wilkie, who's here as one of the product uh, designers, product managers. Uh, he's actually in my talk, and we got a quick chance to, to chat with him. Yeah, and, and the brain tree, I know, and I've actually interviewed uh, one developer from there. You test it in just extremely well respected development community uh, in Chicago. Um, uh, but I, 
So that's current events, but I, I'm interested in your book and also the concept of clean UX that you're teaching. Yeah. And what does that mean? Yeah. So uh, if you're familiar with Jeff Gotthelm's book, uh, Lean UX, which follows on... I'm more on the dev side, so... Okay, cool, yeah. Yeah. So uh, if you think about Lean Startup, your Lean Startup really is about, you know, how do I get to the customer as quick as possible? How do I validate my risky assumptions? How do I pivot and do the right thing? Oh, the Lean Startup. Lean Startup. Sorry, I'm sorry. That's okay. No, no. Lean UX follows on to that. So Jeff Gotthelm actually wrote the book on Lean UX, and we started using the same ideas. What Lean UX really says is, Hey, if you're going to be doing design, uh, you know, it's not really about delivering documentation, it's about delivering experience and doing that collaboratively with engineering, with design, with product, all together. In so closing some of those loops, some of those Yeah, break those walls down, be very collaborative in nature, uh, as much as possible, we'll either live in the same room or same space together and operate like a startup. Like a startup. And so this is very apropos to a large company like PayPal that uh, had, you know, from an innovation perspective, had uh, obviously stagnated. Uh, coming up to 2011, it just, it just took, it could take six weeks to change the words on the site. And so now we're down to less than five minutes, you know, just based on, just we, we wait five minutes to check the web, you know, you know, uh, the web we're going to get. Uh, so it's, you know, we, we've been transforming the technology stack I talked about that yesterday in the workshop a little bit. <laughs> All with this idea in mind of how do you get engineering? So, so I'm actually writing another book right now for the Lean Startup series called Lean Engineering. Okay. And the idea of Lean Engineering is if you think about engineering from the perspective of enabling and learning, right. what do you do different in engineering? Well, one of those things you do differently is you actually engineer for prototyping. You don't think of prototyping as a separate activity. You actually think of the product should support prototypes. So we've actually engineered our architecture now so that the prototype stack is the same as the production stack. We use Node.js, we use some JavaScript templating on top of that. We can run that on our Java stack, our Node stack, or our C++ stack, you know, our, our templates. So what we do in prototype in a what, weekly or every other week basis, we can feed right in the Agile stream and it's going to become, you know, with a little more massaging, become our production code. So you actually get this economy uh, you know, and you can also take the product and fork it and get, you know, and just do some, uh, you know, some usability studies, what we call Lean Max Scrum Team, and then take it right back into Agile. So how different is that from the concepts of, like, MVP, the minimum viable product? Yeah. Is it, is it the same? It supports basic? it. Okay. It supports it, because what you can do if you've got a real rapid prototyping stack is you can create an MVP. Now, you could create, you know, there's a larger process of, you know, going out to customers, doing home visits, or doing studies or surveys or whatever else. That may include just paper prototype, or using, you know, something like a tool like uh, Prototype on Paper, which you take pictures of your sketches, stitch them together, and you got a working prototype. Or, you know, maybe it's like an action, which is a prototype tool. There's a lot of tools you can use. Uh, but what I was been talking about the last two days is really more what happens when you get that closer to Agile, yeah. and you actually want to you want to somehow marry design into the Agile process. Which has been a, a long time question. And the way we've solved that is by having what we call a Lean UX Scrum team that uh, runs just a little bit ahead of the Agile Scrum team. Uh, but some of the same team members flip between the two teams. And the Lean UX Scrum team is focused on pushing out prototypes and, and showing it to customers. That's their sprint releases. Okay. Whereas the Agile team is doing code that you don't buy. Okay, so, so that's interesting. So you have these two teams running in parallel or near parallel. Yeah. A little bit off from each other, and using two slightly different methodologies for for delivery. Yeah. Uh, what was what was the reason that one was using the Scrum methodology and the other one was using? Well, they both they both use sort of a Scrum methodology. You know, the Lean UX does so Agile. You know, Agile Scrum has a lot of what they, they like to call ceremony. Right. The standups, the weekly yeah. iterations. Right. Right. Yeah. So there's still there's still the concept of standups. You know, in the Lean you know, Scrum team. Uh, but there's not like a lot of stories in the backlog. It's very simple. It's much more hypothesis driven. You're much more, you know, rapidly sketching or creating a design, getting it in prototype form, and then getting it usability testing so you can learn from it. And then what comes out of that, you know, feeds out of that, is stories for the backlog of Agile, code that you can actually reuse because you can develop the UI to a, to a fairly, you know, Rough state, you know, it's uh, got the happy paths and stuff. 
and you've got uh, some of the application built too, and so that we can take and harm that. And what we like to do is flip engineers between the main and the, and the agile, so they are always okay. like here with the customer setup. So this much more of a customer setup. Yeah, it, it, that's very interesting because it's. That makes me think of like the spike into uh, production, uh, kind of a uh, yeah, concept. You just build something that's just good enough, and then yeah. you just clean it up and put it into yeah. the production code base. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's, uh, I heard somebody you know on the design side use the same. You know, engineering we say CI/CD, you know, continuous integration, continuous deployment. We can think of continuous innovation, continuous design. You know, on the so the, the design is, is always a problem. Um, looking back at uh, some of the big companies and trying to bring in these agile or working with more agile methodologies in these larger companies that might be a little bit more, um, let's say, traditional. Yeah. Uh, a little, maybe a little bit stuck in a rut as is it happens in large organizations? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, has that been something that's been uh, openly embraced uh, from the bottom up, or is it pushed down? It's been bottom up and top down, yeah. and outside in, I would say too. You know, if you actually if you look at change models, generally the best change models are top down, uh, up, you know, bottom up, and new DNA from the outside coming in, because you do need new DNA in an organization. Because big organizations that have gotten static, what's happened is, you know. They don't even know why they do stupid stuff, right? right. They just do stupid stuff as they do it. And there's actually smart people in there, but the smart people act stupid. Right. You know, because this is the way organizations work like that. And you and then you have some bad DNA and you have some antibodies that are in the organization that resist change. And so you have to flush the system out, you have to like, you know, uh, get rid of some of those antibodies, change some of those antibodies into actually being something positive, uh, to get change going. So yeah, it's you know, I mean, Peacock, frankly, coming in 2011, from Netflix, uh, I knew what it was like. I, I'd done a lot of investigation. It was it was screwed up. I mean, screwed up from technology, from process, and design. Everything was... I don't think there was a single, you know, organization, from, from, I'm thinking from a customer-centric perspective, that was really operating right. Uh, and some of us, you know, because they, they had to, at some point, right the ship and really turn the dial towards risk. They'd be risk averse, make sure payments went through, uh, and in and in that whole uh, pendulum swing, you lose the experience. You lose the fact that you're freezing accounts and putting the accounts on hold that are very good people that are doing charity or doing whatever else, and all those stories get out there. Yeah. And over time, it creates this very angry because what you do with people's money personally affects them, right. and they don't forget it. Yeah, and yeah, and you're right. I hadn't even thought about that before this interview, but. About the uh, there's the constant story on Reddit about the yeah. my this charity or my Kickstarter got frozen. And yeah. I don't know why. Yep. Yeah. And what we do is what I mean, David does is I do this. A bunch of us do this. We're watching Reddit. We're watching Hacker News. We're watching Twitter. As soon as we see something like that, we go fix the problem. But then what we do is we look under the cover saying, "Okay, what's the policy change that needs to happen?" Sometimes those things aren't overnight. You know, for example, I had, uh, I forget who it was exactly, but I had, you know, one of the conference organizers, you know, he, all of a sudden he got his accounts frozen line, and we went to work on it, and, you know, it was obvious that, look, th this is a common occurrence. You can't just say if somebody's, all of a sudden, money starts coming in really, really fast, that that's a bad thing, you know, because there are certain scenarios where that works. So the risk team has to develop different Models, models, you know, because yeah. you think about it, you got 120 million customers. You know, it's not like somebody sitting there going, "I'm going to freeze this account." It's just computer algorithms, right? That's right. And then what happens? You have if your, you know, call center support team is not enabled to fix those problems, then you, you double whammy it, right? Right. So just second to mind. So David did things like you know the the, the team actually uh, that does call center support. Some of them they, they actually enable them with what they call tokens, almost like Google tokens. Right. Where basically, if they they can take one of those tokens and fix any problem, and can't get fired, they can't oh, get in right. trouble. If they make a mistake, you learn from the mistake. So you have a certain amount of these tokens you can kind of utilize to get out. It's, it's, it's like get out of jail you're enabled. You. We're gonna trust you. Yeah. Do just do what you gotta do. Yeah. But we're gonna have a safeguard. Where yeah, you and it's a little bit of spending there you have yeah. to do with it. You know, so you, you don't go so willy nilly. Really you know, you, you know, you think about it. And you know, yeah, this is obviously what you should fix. Yeah. So those kind of things have changed, and we actually, you know, uh, 
I don't know the exact number, but it's a pretty high number uh, each month, less account freezes, less account holds. Funny story, I'll give you a funny story. So uh, last, uh, earlier this year, there was a story came on Hacker News about this kid who created a JavaScript library, an animation library. And he was a junior in, in college, I actually, in Northern Kentucky University. And uh, PayPal had locked his account because uh, he made a tremendous, I mean, I'm talking about a tremendous amount of money uh, in a very short period of time. And he got on Hacker News and said, I think he said something like, you know, I made about $200,000. And uh, PayPal's locked my account. Yeah. So we saw it. We immediately went to work, unlocked his account, and we hired him. So oh, really? He came in and did amazing stuff for us, one of the best interns I've ever had. Yeah, and he's coming back. We made him off. He's coming back next year. And doing some of that. Had a blast. We we're about to do a bunch of articles about that, and I really love doing that because, you know, PayPal has been. I gave a talk in Ireland last week, a uh, Node conference, and uh, one of the guys was writing up stories about it. He said he called my talk mesmerizing because he said all of us in the crowd had written PayPal off as being in the dark ages. Right, right, and it was so refreshing because you know we're leading the charge on Node. We're one of the companies that's actually. We're about to open source a bunch of new frameworks. But, you know, we brought a bunch of people from the outside, from other companies. We also had some great people inside that were already there. And we're, and we're changing. It. I kind of like that story. That's a fun story for me, is, you know, how do I get engineering and design work together? How do I get great technology? And frankly, I'm having no trouble recruiting all. I'm getting some really great people. Because, you know, people, at the end of the day, engineers and designers, whoever, what you're going to work on is really important. The impact you're going to have. Right? So we got that. Who are you going to work with? So I've brought some great people in from lots of good companies. That's important. And how you're going to work, that's this lean UX, lean style of working, is critical. If you get the who, how, and the what down right, yeah. of course you got to pay decent. <laughs> uh, have good, maybe good location helps. Well, but those are all, those are all, you know, they're not the main thing, right? People make all kinds of sacrifices to get the how, who, and the what. Well, I mean, it sounds like you, one of the thing, one of the things when you hear about a story like uh, the young man who made two hundred thousand dollars off his library is yeah. he's got some decent seed money that he could spend to think about the next yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, but convincing him that you obviously you had to bring something other than just pure money yeah. to him yeah. and say yeah. you're going to have this environment where you're going to be have some latitude and some yeah. freedom to do something interesting. With well, for, you know, fortunately at the same time, I've, I've hired uh, a friend of mine who. He used to head up search at Netflix. And he'd gone on to be the CTO of mobile at Zynga. Previously, he had been at Amazon, helped build the initial cloud, and even uh, the early days of Mac OS. So the guy's well traveled. Yeah. You know, wonderful guy. So uh, we were able to bring Emmanuel, the intern, in and work directly with Ron. So he got to work with one of the best minds yeah. you know, around. And, uh, yeah, and that's something that, that isn't that, just money. That's more than money. Right. Yeah. Right. And then, of course, Jeff Harrell, my team, is just. Really brilliant, and another guy, Eric, that I brought from Netflix, and a few other folks that come from Netflix, are just really smart, awesome guys who get the full package of not just it's just not just engineering, but it's design, it's customer centric, and that's what drives someone like Emmanuel, right? Uh, this intern is he, in the day he's passionate about creating the best experience possible. I mean, he would he would sit there and go, you know, when I do this because he was building an HTML5 equivalent during the that. And, and nailing it, you know, infinite scrolling, doing all the crazy complicated stuff. Yeah. And he's going like, look, when I move this, you know, and I can see it because I'm a pixel maniac too. Right. But some of the people on the team couldn't see it. it, it every once in a while, j jigs by one pixel. <laughs> that just drove him nuts. Yeah. He was going to get that right. And I love that attention to detail. Uh, and, it, of course, I have that too, so I think he enjoyed working, working with, with me because I would come back and say, you know, the friction is not exactly right. You know, the, the physics is not exactly right on this issue of five experience versus the native. He said, "Well, how so?" And I'd show him. You know, I say, "No, notice that. You know, how the ease out the very last. You know, a little bit slows down." And so, within about an hour, he came back, checked this out, and he had it nailed. Yeah, yeah. And he loved that. You know, the being challenged like that. So. Yeah, and, and, and knowing that he's working with people he can respect. Yeah. That's, yeah. You know that. I mean, it's not about that you won't respect who you're working with, but oh, somebody who's you, you want to be challenged. Yeah, right? who's going to push you and be like somebody who's been there. Yeah. So. yeah. Well, thank you very much for yes. taking time to stop. I really enjoyed it. It's great to meet you. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you. 
User groups with lots to say, interviews and more. No way. Sharing great ideas in the tech community. Fascinating conversations, a plethora of information. Find out for yourself today at ugtastic.com.